uh, you mute. Sorry. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our session today. Let's talk chaos engineering with harness. Uh, this is the first part of DevOps practices and processes for modern cloud native app series. My name is Pulina and I'm a senior DevOps engineer based in Abu Dhabi. My passions are automation and innovation. I love using my skills to contribute to the development processes while acquiring new skills in the meantime. Besides my work, I love traveling, swimming, skiing, um, participating in the challenging events like Spartan races. And now it's time for our speakers to introduce themselves, uh, Pritvi Rash and Sayan Mundal. Hey everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, this is Prithvi Raj here. Uh, thanks again, Polina and Walid for organizing this uh, amazing meetup and we are glad to be joining you folks. And uh, my name is Prithvi Raj. I am based out of uh, Bhubaneswar, India. And uh, I have been working on the Litmus Chaos project as a, as a community manager since the past two years. Litmus Chaos is a CNCF incubating project. We'll talk about it more. And other than that, I have been part of various community events as a co-organizer, namely Chaos Carnival, Kubernetes Community Days, KCD, I mean, uh, Bangalore and Chennai. And then other than that, I've been part of the Chaos Engineering community since long, and I've been organizing Chaos Engineering meetups uh, every month. And uh, it's it's more about uh, Chaos Engineering only from my end in the CNCF space. And other than that, as you know, I'm, I'm part of the, the Harness team as a technical community manager participating in, in their community. Sayan, you can go ahead. Thanks for the intro. Uh, so hi everyone i'm really glad to be here it's a great opportunity and thanks for having us again uh as for me i my name is shine uh, i am a senior software engineer at harness and i uh, work on the litmus community side as a as the one of the maintainers or one of the core members who manages and uh, maintains the project along with a team of other members as well and uh, Apart from the open source side, there are two projects as well which are built on top of the open source Litmus, which is the Hans module that we are going to talk about today. So those I also work uh, as a software engineer on on those projects. So yeah, really excited to share uh, the progress, the things you can do um, with the updated uh, versions as a wrapper of the open source one. We are also going to take a look at the open source product, uh, take a look at the new features, and yeah and do some hands-on demos, I'm really excited. Okay, uh, so let's, uh, let's start from the beginning. Uh, what is chaos engineering and what is its relation to DevOps? Uh, so Polina is starting this DevOps meetup we would like to know why did you choose chaos engineering as the initial session? Why is it important? What it is exactly? Well, I've heard in the chaos engineering in the past in my well uh, in my previous companies, we've tried to implement it a little bit, and uh, I would like to learn more, like uh, how it can be integrated with Kubernetes environment okay uh, awesome. Britain, can... uh, sure sure Walid. awesome Polina. i think the the idea of featuring chaos engineering is is amazing uh, is an amazing one and uh, i mean chaos engineering as you know or many people might not know was was a was a practice introduced by Netflix, uh, where they, they just started production testing and started inducing faults in their systems to identify real life uh, chaotic scenarios that can happen or real life disruptions or vulnerabilities present in the system that can disrupt the the day to day production systems. And uh, soon after the open source project Chaos Monkey came into play and then the, the idea was to expand the the whole implementation or ideation of chaos engineering that is deliberately inducing a fault into your system or injecting 
a chaotic situation scenario in your system to identify the possible faults that can that can happen in real life when the system goes in production or when when you, you are actually there there is a demand for scaling or there is a demand from the system and the examples of uh chaos engineering experiments can be uh, deleting a pod if if you are talking about the kubernetes paradigm then it can be deleting a pod killing a container uh, uh your disk cpu uh, runs or or memory loss or or such examples are day to day uh, chaos engineering examples that that uh, people are experimenting with and then it's it's just expanding uh, every day to to your infrastructure in form of you know you are testing in production on your aws or your azure or your gcp or your vms so so that's the idea of chaos engineering and in the devops space it comes more in, on the op side we will we'll, we'll talk about it more uh, in, our, in our slides as well and the the idea was it, it it was more from the deploy operate and monitor side of things and sres started this practice or sres were the initial persona who were practicing chaos engineering but uh, slowly slowly it it moved on and now the developer persona as well is using chaos engineering uh, to to practice resiliency or to bring in the idea of resiliency and it's it's becoming an important part of the devops loop and and testing in production uh, doesn't just mean uh, penetration or integration of the various other types of testing but chaos is, uh, testing is has actually crossed uh, the majority adoption uh, segment in in the overall chasm or the overall kubernetes adoption or devops adoption chasm so so that's that's mm -hmm. what will be an inter introduction to chaos engineering but let's let's talk more about the history and how, how it, it goes ahead with, with harness. Polina, any questions? Um, uh, I would like to see the presentation and uh, in maybe, yeah, we'll continue with the questions later. I'm yeah. really curious let's, about well, let's it. Share, let's share the presentation. Absolutely. So I'll be uh, talking about, uh, I mean, chaos engineering and, and the history and, and introducing uh, the open source litmus project to you, what chaos engineering exactly is. And then Sian will be talking about the honest chaos engineering platform. And hopefully we'll, we'll have a quick demo from him as well. So All let right. me share my screen. Can you, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. So let's get started. Uh, let's talk chaos engineering with Harness. Uh, I mean, I think we both have introduced ourselves, so I won't take a lot of time. I've been working as a community manager for the Rickness Chaos Project, part of the Harness team now. It all started off at Magneta and now then Chaos Native and now part of Harness. And I think uh, Cyan has also introduced himself. So let's let's move ahead and let's see what the agenda for uh, today is. We'll be introducing Chaos Engineering. We'll be talking about Litmus Chaos a little bit and the Harness Chaos Engineering platform. We'll talk about how the journey of Litmus Chaos uh, came out and became, uh, gave the the ideation of Harness Chaos Engineering the wings. And then we'll, we'll be diving into the core components and then a little bit of a demo and then the future roadmap. Which, which obviously will help people understand what's what's next in, in this journey for us. So, so let's move ahead. Act one, chaos engineering, a closer look. So before we move on to chaos engineering, let's understand what exactly resiliency is or what exactly is resilience or what are the examples of weaknesses and resilience that usually happen in, in, in a system. And here we are taking an example of a Kubernetes system. I mean, let's say a pod is evicted from a node or a node goes to a not ready state or there's a memory leak in a container. So what exactly is the example of the system being resilient or the system being weak? So a simple, I mean, answer to this is uh, the pod is rescheduled and the dependent service is healthy. So the, the this system is resilient or the system is still resilient in spite of such an outage or such a disruption happening in the system but let's say the dependent service slows down or turns unhealthy or is not able to actually cope up to this sort of an outage 
then what exactly happens? The system goes down and the system turns out to be weak. And there's there's a there's an outage, there's an outage in the system, and that causes downtime. Basically, that is what is the main reason of, of downtimes in the system. And then you know you need to fix the issue and the systems are basically not resilient. So as you know, I mean resilience is nothing but the system's ability to keep up in spite of such a disruption or a fault taking place. And that is where the whole concept of chaos engineering came into play, where the idea was to play with the possible possibilities of weaknesses in a system. And every system has to go down. Basically, it's it's not uh, it, it's not that uh, every system or any system in this world is completely resilient. It's 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 a matter of time. It's basically when does the system go down. Or how does the system go down? That's that's what we need to anticipate, and it's it's basically Murphy's law. Like if you anticipate something to go wrong, then it will go wrong eventually, and and that's what happens with these dynamic infrastructures that we are dealing with today. It, it might be Kubernetes. I mean, Kubernetes adoption is is at its peak and it's growing every day, and even the the whole DevOps ecosystem, the way folks are moving on from monolithic uh, infrastructures to microservices. I mean, it's it's just a matter of time that you will see more and more dynamic uh, systems coming in and weaknesses are a part of it. Weaknesses come come alongside change or, or development in systems. So so that's what brings in the idea of chaos engineering. And let's, let's just see what causes downtime. What are the reasons these downtimes happen. I mean, your application can fail, your infrastructure can fail. There might be operational failures. I mean, let's take an example here. Let's just take an example of, let's say in India, we are have, having uh, these uh, big billion day sales organized by Amazon. Or, or all over the world, we have Black Friday sales. We have, I mean, so many sales. Or, or there's a new movie or a new TV series that comes out and people are completely in love with it and there's a spike in the number of users at, in a particular platform let's say Netflix or Amazon Prime and that is what requires I mean the system to cope up with this spike in the number of users I mean that, that's part of operational failures of course capacity issues but the system needs to scale and that can actually cause any kind of issue I mean there can be a service timeout there can be a device failure or a network failure and these failures eventually cause downtime these failures eventually impact your systems and these outages basically can cause loss of millions of dollars if, if you you can see these examples from slack from facebook to amazon to british airways delta airlines everyone has faced an outage or two in the recent few few years and that's that's something these disruptions are basically something that need to be catered to or that's what brought in the idea of chaos engineering in the first place why because outages are expensive i mean there are there are thousands of outages you you lose money you lose confidence in your systems and then the people you lose confidence in your application and you know there are there's a lot of loss of work and and a lot more that that can actually harm you i mean that, that's that's something that you don't want only because you did not test your systems beforehand and that's why the idea of chaos engineering or the chaos first principle where why wait for an outage to happen why not test your systems beforehand and adjust the capabilities of the system the the resilience of the system and the possible weak points of the system so i think we have seen a lot of examples here we, we saw the examples of british airways atlassian facebook aws these are some of the outages that are real life examples and that that are strong examples of why chaos engineering is important and now let's move on to obviously the cost i think we talked talked about the cost loss of customer confidence damage to the brand integrity there's i mean so many other impacts i mean there's legal action reduced stock price and an average downtime obviously stays for approximately 79 minutes you don't want to have a downtime for so long you you want to mitigate this and the best way to mitigate is obviously co continuous testing yeah keep on testing your systems again and again and again to identify how resilient your systems are to various sort various sorts of real life scenarios and that's where chaos engineering comes into play so the chaos 
uh, chaos engineering is nothing but the idea or the process of deliberately inducing a fault in your system or testing a, a computing system complex system to ensure that it can withstand any sort of possible disruptions or possible outages that can that can happen in real life like, just like i i mentioned the examples of downtimes that that usually happen when when your systems go down and that is where chaos engineering plays a huge role where you induce a fault okay, so Mm -hmm. Yes, Father. So basically, uh, if I understand you well, in the DevOps uh, traditional software development life cycle, it will be on the testing phase. Like, uh, so we can consider this part of the testing phase, or is it after after deployment? Uh, this could be like gam gamification to enhance the operator skills and stuff like that. W in what phase do usually you see it in the DevOps cycle? So uh, a lot of people believe that where in the DevOps space you can use chaos engineering, but the belief is that you can use uh, chaos engineering in any any sort of uh, any phase uh, while, while you're developing. I mean, you can use in your CI CD or in your uh, I mean, development stage or in your pre-staging or in your staging platform or your staging. But if you see it from a testing perspective, then chaos engineering is not just testing your systems, but it's continu it's a continuous process where if one disruption or let's say the one fault that you test is, is validated, your, I mean, let's say you're having your SLOs, the SLOs are validated, then you go on to the next fault. You you check out the next, next possible disruption that can happen. So... And eventually the goal is to use it in the deployment phase where you are deploying in production. That's that's why it comes more on the ops side. But as I said that now the it, it it's activating the overall DevOps loop. So so chaos engineering basically can come in each phase, each phase of, of the DevOps loop. That's 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 the overall or the major idea why chaos engineering just stands out a little different from the normal way or the regular way of, of testing your systems and, and yes sorry. if it's integrated in the ci system how expensive will it be i mean for resources and uh, time time consumption if it so i mean it's again you have to be ready for it people usually are skeptical about uh, chaos engineering because it it needs a separate team it requires a lot of idea and uh, only large companies started off practicing this initially. I mean, slowly, slowly with in the past couple of years, even small companies are moving on to it. But the exact, it, it obviously requires uh, a separate fund allocation and and a focus. So, I mean, again, but, but again, the idea is to make it as feasible as possible. And that is why, why, just look on to enterprise solutions. I mean, uh, that's again, uh, just for a start. If you want to start, anyone can start. And there are amazing open source solutions out there in the form of Litmus Chaos. Uh, I mean, there's Chaos Toolkit and there are other, uh, other tools as well out there in the community which help you get started. And I think it will, I mean, the initial allocation is of certain personnel. To, to the chaos engineering project and identifying your systems and organizing game days. I think that's that's something which requires dedicated effort. But but the also the belief is that with, with time and with so many solutions out there and with so many possibilities out there, I think the, the overall cost is is pretty much going down and it just is becoming like any other testing. I mean testing is important and there are there's so much money being invested in testing and security and resiliency. So chaos engineering is becoming just another practice, uh, a mandatory or a, not a mandatory yet, but a mandatory practice in, in future that that's that's pretty much feasible. And I don't think uh, being skeptical about this practice uh, practices is really helping because majority of of the folks out there, majority of the companies that I have seen and from the community as well are are participating and adopting this this practice in in their for their infrastructure i i hope that answers yeah thank you 
so as we saw again i'll i'll continue what's chaos engineering exactly and what's the idea of it so i mean the there there's a process i think this this is very important that is identifying the process and how do the principles of chaos engineering work and how do you identify uh how, where to run your chaos experiments how to run your chaos experiments so it it moves on in a loop where you first i mean obviously select the system to test and hypothesize around it what exactly are the real life scenarios that can happen and you identify the i mean the steady state of your system that's that's the first step where how does your system behave when it's steady and how does your system behave when there's a real life disruption that that can happen and then you create a, create a hypothesis around it and then you select the the actual chaos experiments that that you want to run let's you whatever you want to simulate let's say an aws failure and an ec2 failure or anything that you want to run you select that experiment and then you run those chaos experiments on the on the target system the system which which you are testing basically and then you you observe you observe how what's happening to the system when it's normal what's happening when there's a disruption i mean there are so many observability tools out there that help you and there's so much monitoring that's that's being done and and that is where you observe the results of the experiment it's it's something which going along uh, well integrated with other tools let's say splunk datadog i mean dynatrace and and so many more tools grafana and and that, that is where you you basically find out the the reality of your system and then you use these learnings to make your systems more reliable you you basically improve your targets you actually identify that these these targets are are the right ones for these particular chaos experiments and then you build scenarios and then you add to it you you schedule them accordingly you use it for your teams so these are some some capabilities that obviously come alongside i mean that's that's i think a must when you're running chaos engineering but eventually it it goes as a loop and then you again basically run or identify uh the steady state and and continue this this loop so we'll we'll see this more briefly but but let's say uh i mean what does harness believe or what's what's our idea of running chaos engineering and why is reliability a challenge today i mean the the basic idea is that chaos engineering is required on each and every stage of your application development or basically an application is in a form of a pyramid there's your application that's it's on on top if let's say this this is an example of kubernetes application and there are hundreds and thousands of other microservices being run on on these platforms and then there's your application and then there are other applications running let's say a mongodb or your kafka and then there are cloud native services let's say a core dns envoy i mean your database is in form of open ebs and then there are kubernetes services running and, in, and eventually there is your infrastructure layer which which is the final accumulation of your application but every stage or every every layer of the pyramid needs to be i mean resilient and and that, that that's where i mean initially legacy devops just suggested build one application ship it run it but but now with cloud native devops there are hundreds of microservices you need to uh, i mean the world is dynamic you need to ship them faster and run them in in i mean more than 100 scenarios and that's why where there's a possibility of a failure and that's that's the eventual cloud native problem that's the problem that that chaos engineering is solving because even a failure in a single dependent service can actually get your system down so moving on what's the chaos engineering maturity model how do you mature your systems these are the hows and where you you exactly test them i mean i i gave you a scenario it it moves from a bottom to up approach where you first move from from your infrastructure layer to your application layer you test but the hows are basically a top down approach you develop a scenario you i mean that's you create a chaos engineering scenario or we also call it a workflow or or basically game days are run according to that i was talking about game days and game days are nothing but organizing 
uh, the, the the implementation of specific chaos engineering scenarios according to your application to identify faults list them and then identify the reliability and weaknesses weakness points of your system and similarly these chaos scenarios are developed they are verified and automated you want to automate the process and then the resilience of individual components are identified and then they are integrated into the, the qa so it's it's basically a shift left testing module or that's that's the maturity module on how you can develop so whoever is looking forward to get started with chaos i think that's the idea you got to follow and i'm i'm, I'm sure that there will be a lot of roadblocks you face but uh, it's the eventual goal is is to ensure that your your systems are, are resilient so i think the, i we have talked about this where, where does chaos engineering come in in the devops paradigm and the feedback loops basically uh, feedback loop basically gets activated by testing in production so i won't waste a lot of time here so how to do chaos engineering this again from an slo perspective you identify the steady state conditions you introduce a fault if your slos are met then yes your systems are resilient if your slos don't continue to be met then there's a weakness found and then you again move on to introduce a fault and this this loop kind of continues did i hear you right you said uh, testing and production yes uh, don't tell me testing and production in fridays <laughs> i i mean yeah that's that's again uh, I shouldn't said, test but... yeah i mean shouldn't we apply um, case engineering first like in a test environment or in a gamification environment of course, of, we course are 100%. of course the the, the adoption yeah. goes in such a way that you won't want to be testing in production from the first step you you okay. need a, a development scenario or a, or a, let's, let's say as a game day chaos engineering game days are meant to be run because you want to be absolutely sure before moving into running chaos engineering in production and and the idea is to basically run uh, the 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 eventual idea is to run chaos tests in production and there are okay. many folks out there who are already running in production but each and every one of them started off with the first step where they they ran these cases in their pre staging or their development environments all right All right. So moving on, I think we have talking, uh, have, we have spoken a lot about uh, how chaos engineering is typically done. I mean, there are game days that are organized. It was rarely integrated into the CI/CD of your system, uh, and this, I mean, it wasn't seen as a practice where uh, it can be formulated or used on on all sort of systems, or it can come in to your pipeline anywhere but today i think once we, we have gotten over these typical practices these typical practices are basically outdated they are not the ones which are being followed as modern chaos engineering or cloud native chaos engineering practices today chaos engineering has moved beyond just sres and today even uh, developers and other personas are practicing chaos it, it's being integrated with your ci cd i mean with your drone ci or jenkins or uh, gitlab everyone's somehow or the other focusing on bringing chaos engineering into into the systems um, from manual planning and execution to automation the, the journey has been long and while observability was something which was seen as a far fetched idea for chaos where it was just some yaml files being run i think today our systems are being observed in such a way where each and every second matters and every second counts where you are able to see what are the disruptions happening in the system so these are some problems that we we listed out from from the existing solutions they were not automated there was lack of collaboration and and there was i mean it was driven by root cause analysis and it was not exactly driven by the idea of resolving solutions where you know the the approach should be modern and dynamic and it should be a collaborative process where teams are using chaos multiple teams in in a company are somehow in, in some way or the other inducing faults in the system and these are being automated and integrated to 
your CI/CD pipelines, and and that's where a better solution of uh, chaos engineering came into play, where we thought of an idea where you know why not bring in teams and create a centralized control plane where teams can come in and experiments can be used by not just the SRE but the developer persona as well. There should be, I mean, there should be public hubs available with a list of ready to use experiments. And we, we devised a chaos hub and uh, that the chaos hub basically helps you uh, get in all the pre-written experiments and create a chaos workflow with various experiments suiting your scenarios. It can be integrated into your CI CD so that you can find weaknesses while you are building and then observability, obviously, as I said, you need to impact and manage your SLOs and errors to measure the impact of, of the chaos experiment that is being induced. And that is where the foundation principles of chaos engineering were developed. So the foundation principles of chaos engineering, according to us, obviously are that it should be open source powered or open source driven. There must be, there should be a hub or there should be experiments that are already there or contributed by the community. So community is, I think this is not something about chaos engineering here, but just cloud native development that community is, is key to developing any sort of project out there. And a strong community makes a strong project or a strong technology. And I think the chaos engineering community has been vital in helping us identify various scenarios Let's say there's the, the community which belongs to the banking sector, to the automobile sector, to I mean to the uh, e-commerce uh, e sector, to the telecom sector. These have contributed various scenarios, various use cases, and that's how the Chaos Hub was built, where uh, the, uh, the the experiments were out there. I mean GitOps, you you need to scale and you need to help. As I said, it's very important that your CI/CD is is having chaos engineering not as a commodity but as as an essential necessity and then open api and life cycle management just to to help you integrate with other potential softwares out there and observability is key to identify what or how exactly is chaos being induced in your system and these were the foundation principles of chaos engineering and that is how chaos engineering was developed and harness became a part of part of this journey and and basically the harness chaos engineering is today powered by litmus chaos so now finally we are here to talk about litmus chaos which is nothing but an open source cloud native chaos engineering framework or a chaos engineering tool which was founded way back uh, in 2017 we just found the project to test a cloud native data project that we were running and the idea was just to write a pod delete experiment and a, and a pod network loss experiment and and just to just to create some some normal experiments test them and and just be let it be a closed source project but soon or sooner than later it became an open source project itself we donated it to the cncf it it became a part of a, a larger ecosystem where, where the idea was to to make it community collaborative and actually follow the latest chaos testing practices, make chaos engineering uh, a go-to practice. And today I think it's it's been a flag bearing project for, for the chaos engineering ecosystem. And it's, it's a CNCF incubating project, just became an incubating project in January this year. And now it's, it's just following some, some amazing principles to do help folks uh, use chaos in their systems it's amazing so, amazing how you started with the single bot so <laughs> so you started with the single bot deletion and you created this awesome uh, framework and it's incubated by cncf what is an advanced uh, chaos experiment if if a single bot is the start what is the most extensive one you saw that uh, really extensive I mean, uh, I think uh, the the latest experiments that are up on the Chaos Hub. Uh, I am really fond of IO Chaos. I mean, IO Chaos is something which is which is really hard. I mean, it, it impacts your overall system. Or uh, I mean, there's Pod HTTP latency. That's one of the latest experiments where uh, where 
which which has come out and i i'm intrigued by i think these experiments i mean a pod delete or a node kill or a container kill was the basic basics of uh, inducing faults in, in a kubernetes system but with litmus chaos i think i'll i'll just take you through through the chaos hub as well so if uh, you you check out the litmus chaos hub i mean this is the website but if you check the the chaos hub here then there's a pool of experiments more than 50 um, experiments based on general kubernetes aws core dns cassandra kafka and and other platforms as well so, which which i mean signify that uh, there are so many experiments that that can be that can be induced or so many possible faults and it's it's just a pool of experiments i mean there's a vast pool out there these are just the 54 which we created or the community has donated but there's a lot more. I mean, VMware, we are still developing. So there's there's that to come. And then I think uh, AWS SSM, I mean, these experiments are still in development. But but this speaks volumes of how how uh, intriguing are our uh, chaos experiments or what all disruptions that can happen in from an application to, to your infrastructure. Okay. So so that so that's that's about uh, the, the chaos hub and this is the litmus chaos website where you can just go in get your resources get started with the docs or with with the github where, where you get some info and read me and how to contribute raise issues run run your chaos experiments start from basics and then you move ahead and then there's an amazing community out there which uh, which which i think you can you can check on the slack as well there's an amazing litmus chaos slack channel where you can join in and ask your questions, ask uh, your doubts, get started with chaos engineering. From getting started with chaos engineering to getting started with litmus chaos, I think the, the the journey is is a vast one. And you can you can easily, I mean, be a part of the community and get started. So moving back, I think these are just some stats I'll I'll con conclude with. Uh, it started in. 2017 it's i mean there's been more than 1 million experiment runs and the usage growth has exponentially increased over the last few few months and the 2.0 stable platform released last year in august and now as you can see it's it's adopted by so many amazing folks and and there are more there's adidas there's fis there's ifood there's vmware red hat and so many other folks are, are using litmus chaos and that's that's something that has powered harness chaos engineering which sign will be talking about but but i think the idea of uh, powering uh, an enterprise tool or or a cloud native solution with with an open source solution which is a cncf project which is backed by cncf is is an amazing idea in in today's devops devops ecosystem or devops development so with this i will hand over uh, the proceedings to sign uh, thanks a lot folks if you have any questions feel free thank to you. ask them and Sian thank you can take it for me sure just give me one sec oh the live demo yeah yeah <laughs> I hope my network is a little better now. I am changing it. Okay. Should not be yes, a lag. Yeah. Cool. So let's see if my mobile net can handle the chaos. We'll see. There will um, be external chaos. <laughs> and then chaos. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So can you see my screen? I'll uh, just yeah. share it. Okay. Yeah. This, awesome. is, this is your screen, so, huh? Yeah, this is my screen. Uh, the introduction of Harness Chaos Engineering. Yeah. So um, uh, I will be talking about the HCE. So I'll be sh sh saying Harness Chaos Engineering as HCE for short. Uh, so I'll be talking about HCE, the advanced features that you get on top of Litmus, and also the architecture, how we actually do the chaos. And then we're going to run through a, a small demo of uh, an application called Sock Shop, which is like a microservice demo uh, application. So to start with the introduction, uh, what Prithvi just mentioned about uh, what he just explained about Litmus Chaos, it seems nothing but um, a wrapper around the entire thing, around Litmus. 
giving you all the features that Litmus has plus a few extra features. By extra, I mean you get um, added support from Harness, you get uh, better authentication, you get more advanced experiments, which is like, I would say definitely the selling point because you have more and more advanced experiments that you can leverage, that you can use to create uh, your own scenarios that you can modify to uh, fit your use cases. So that is one of the strong points of I think and internet there chaos. Is a problem with the network. Yes. Uh, for Litmus, you have to use a cluster and then install your agents and everything. But with uh, HCE, you can actually go to cloud.chaosnative.com, and that should get you directly to the SaaS offering. So you can just sign in with Google, GitHub, or just with your email, and then you should basically be able to connect at most two age agents, and the rest everything is unlimited. So you can go ahead and. Uh, play around with uh, whatever you want to in the entire Litmus platform. Cool. So that was the introduction of uh, what this platform is uh, mainly about. Now the experiments, which are uh, one of the best things about uh, using HC, which is you have application-specific chaos. You have uh, generic chaos, which is like the basic ones that we just talked about, the body uh, container chaos, node chaos, uh, IO, and all those things. And also we have a um, uh, VM level chaos, so like we have VMware and also uh, some chaos targeting specific cloud providers. So uh, for example, in this case, Azure, AWS, um, GCP. Uh, so those kind of things, those are different types of chaos along with the application chaos, you can of course combine them. And like the possibilities are endless because you can merge, mix and match and do all these kind of things together in one single scenario. So this scenario building is also something that we are going to see, but essentially you can chain them, create multiple uh, scenarios based on your use cases and then run the entire scenario at once. So uh, what's exciting about this uh, new thing, uh, this uh, HCE, the wrapper on top of Litmus, is basically uh, it gives you all the features of Litmus, which are nothing but scheduling, uh, the resilient score calculation, uh, addition of custom image registry, monitoring, uh, then your own chaos agents. So we'll be talking about what chaos agent, chaos center, these things mean. But yeah, these are like just uh, uh, an overview of what exactly you get with HC. So you have uh, teaming, you have uh, your RBAC, uh, you have a workflow editor, which you can use to edit your, your workflows. Then you have the support for GitOps, which is let's say, if you do not want your, uh, data, your workflow data, your chaos data to be stored in the database where chaos, um, where Litmus or this HCE is installed, uh, HCE if on-prem is installed, or let's say Litmus chaos is installed, then uh, you can switch to a GitOps model, which is basically you'll be choosing Git as your single source of truth. So all the data that you're uh, you know, working with, uh, all, the, all the workflow data, all the chaos data will be stored in your Git repository. Uh, so that way you're spacing it out completely to a separate version control and you can maintain yeah, that's uh, specific to your use cases and not rely on the uh, database that Litmus is providing. Uh, and also addition of Chaos Hub, which is like from where you get all the different list of experiments, right? So that is from the Chaos Hub. So Chaos Hub is also embedded as a part of the installation. Uh, and of course, you can create and add more Chaos Hubs if you want to. And then you also get control over your Chaos results because then you can export those Chaos results into your own solution, you know, like Afana, Prometheus, and those kind of things. And also you can enhance your experiments by creating probes, uh, by um, updating the chaos engine, tuning certain parts of the experiment, and then you can sort of customize it uh, to your own uh, needs. And also- uh, How easy is it to customize? Chaos. How easy is it to customize and write your own uh, chaos experiment? So there are two things actually. Oh, this one, one major thing, which is this, this CRD which is called Chaos Engine. And that is like the heart of where you do the customization on top of your um, experiment. So for example, let's say, let's say you have a basic pod delete experiment. So the pod delete experiment would have what we call a Chaos Engine. And the engine is like where you give the tunables. Like I want this experiment to run for one minute or two minutes. Uh, I want it to run three times in a minute. Um, and then I want it to target this namespace. Those kind of things are, uh, like 
sort of carried down from the blueprint, which we call a chaos experiment, which is the next slide. So those things are tuned. We can tune it in the chaos engine part. So that CID is what's responsible for uh, doing these enhancements on top of your uh, basic blueprint. So that feature is something which is the chaos engine CID. Yeah. And um, uh, an extra thing that is also supported by the HC on-prem version, which is the air gap support, which you will not get on the SAS version. So if you go for on-prem, then all the features that are there are there, obviously. Plus, you get air gap support as well. So yeah, that's an additional feature on top of uh, what you get for SAS. So when I use HCE, it's not just for Kubernetes. It can be for VMware, it can be for AWS, for Google Cloud. Yeah, right. OK, just give me one second. Yes. Someone in my door, just one second. We bring. Prithvi, how easy is it? Uh, do you have to learn Go? Do you have to learn Python to basically write the, these chaos experiments? So, Valid, I think uh, if you're using Litmus, then uh, you can you write your experiments in Go and Python. We, we started off with Go. Most of the Litmus experiments are written on Go. And uh, then now the experiments are, are written in Python as well. And then some of them are written in Ansible as well. But if you are well versed with Go, then I think writing a chaos experiment with you for you won't be that difficult. All right. Thank you. Actually, uh, I would also be, uh, I also add one more thing, which is we have this Litmus SDK, which actually, actually helps you create this kind of uh, experiments really easily. So I think, uh, I believe the SDK is written in Python, if I'm not wrong, but I have to check the repo once. But yeah, uh, with the help of SDK, like if you know a little bit of Python, you can sort of, uh, it's like a uh, interactive thing. So you can choose what you want to write and then what type of experiments you want to do, and then you can create your own uh, scenarios on top of like experiments on that SDK. All right. So um, uh, this diagram right now that you're seeing in the screen, this is basically the um, flow of how a chaos execution would actually happen in Litmus. So this is not the architecture diagram. That's the next slide. This is like how the chaos would actually happen. So what, what is there in that? Like, there's a lot of things in this diagram, but the three important part is the chaos experiment CR, the chaos engine CR, and the chaos result CR. So this is um, this experiment, this engine, and then the result, this one. So these three are the most important part. Now, the rest of them are like helpers of uh, these three CRDs. So what happens is generally the first point would be the chaos experiment. So chaos experiment is nothing but the blueprint of what you want to do. So in this case, let's take an example of container kill. So the blueprint of container kill may be like all the different environments that it supports, uh, the metadata, and like the, the entire chunk of, uh, uh, you know, templates sort of like a, like a blueprint of an experiment. So like it would have all the metadata, it will have all the configuration, it will have all the environments and everything. Uh, so that is stored in this chaos experiment CID. And the engine CID is, and this chaos experiment CID fetches this data from the chaos hub that was hub.litmus chaos.io. So let's say you want to run any generic experiments, it will fetch the chaos experiment from that hub. You want to run a Kafka or something, then it will fetch that from the hub. And that is where the chaos experiment YAML is stored. And now the next part is chaos engine, which is like modifications or like the tunable part of the chaos experiment of the chaos, uh, the entire workflow. So in the chaos engine, let's say in the chaos experiment, I had a few things like um, environment is uh, app namespace or um, total affected uh, application percentage, or let's say something like um, how much time, how much seconds should it run for? So I gave it something like 60. So in the chaos engine, I can tune that. So I can say like, let's not run it for 60. Let's run the total workflow, the total experiment for 120 seconds. And then I can also change like the interval. So I can say like run, uh, six times in 120 seconds. So it'll sort of divide the timing and like run that much uh, times in that 120 seconds. So those kind of tunings we can do with Chaos Engine YAML on the Chaos Engine YAML. And this is also part of the same uh, YAML file. So these are 
part of the total. These are part of one single YAML file. So at the top, you'll have Chaos Experiment. At the bottom, you have the Chaos Engine. And then there's also a thing called Steps, which we'll be seeing in the demo. But yeah, that is essentially one single big chunk of a YAML file where you have all this metadata. Now, uh, what happens is the Chaos Engine is responsible for doing the tunings, but it is not what triggers the uh, Chaos Experiment. So the execution is triggered by something which is called as Chaos Operator. It's like the heart of the Chaos uh, this entire flow. So it sort of sees that, let's say you try to kill an application on ABC namespace, but the ABC namespace is not there in your cluster. So chaos operator would be the one that will be sort of checking and seeing and validating if that thing, that configurations that you're giving are actually present on your cluster or not. If uh, the policies, the rollback, the RBACs and everything are valid or not. So those kind of reconciliations is what uh, the chaos operator does. And that is like the heart of the entire operation. So once it sees that, okay, whatever configuration you've given, all the validations are right and everything is correct, then this is what will trigger your Chaos Engine. So Chaos Operator would trigger that Chaos Engine, which would trigger the Chaos, uh, the workflow, the experiment that you chose. So in this case, let's say container kill. So it will see that, okay, your application is there, your container is there. Now I would want to kill it. So let's trigger the Chaos Engine. So that is when the Chaos actually starts happening. Now the happening part, the Chaos ha also doesn't, happen in a very straightforward way. There's, uh, they're like, I, I said in a, uh, just before that, if you, let's say, give 120 seconds for the entire workflow and you divide it into smaller chunks, let's say six times of 120 seconds. So how does the application know that you want to run it six times? That's where this chaos runner pod comes in. That's like a helper pod. So the helper pod spins up first. It will see that, okay, I need to run for 120 seconds. So let's say for the first 40 seconds or so, uh, let's, uh, spin this uh, chaos job. So that is where one container kill is uh, running. And then so let's say for another 30 seconds, let's uh, spin this another pod, which is like the chaos job, like another container kill, so another container kill, so like that. So the helper is responsible for spinning this multiple chaos jobs and this all the things are coming from the chaos engine. So that is the entire flow of how it actually happens in, in our backend. And once the application is finished and all the experiments are complete, completed, uh, the phase could be failed or successful based on how you have configured your uh, chaos experiment, chaos scenario. Uh, so once it is done, the chaos result CR is where it stores all the data. So all the data is collected in the chaos result. Now you can either choose to like just see the result and just delete it, or you can also export this data uh, result to your own solution. Like you can uh, monitor it via Grafana, via Prometheus, and those kind of things. So these are the three CRDs which are really important the chaos experiment, the engine, and the chaos result. Now, with the help of this, you would basically be able to export your data out of your cluster to any other solution. You'd be able to fetch data from, let's say, your private uh, hubs and everything. So in this case, it was a public hub, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. You can also create your own experiments from the Litmus SDK, or let's say you just write it manually in a YAML. You can pull this, the ex chaos experiment CRD would be able to pull this data from your private uh, GitHub repository or your private uh, S3 container or anything like that. So yeah, that's the three major parts of uh, Chaos execution. Uh, for the architecture, like I'll make this very simple. So we basically have two things, which is the Chaos Center, uh, Chaos Center, and the Chaos Agent. So um, Chaos Center is the where all the activity happening around Chaos is uh, focused on. So it would have your database connectivity. You will have your GraphQL server, the authentication server. And uh, it will have your different kind of scheduling methods, cron workflows, non-cron workflows, single run workflows, and then all the things that I just talked about, right? Uh, just give me one more second. So, Bolina, how is it so far? It's really interesting. Yes. So... Are you going to start using etc or let me chaos? I'm trying to find a case where we can implement it because the software that we're developing is a little bit particular, but but uh, yeah, yeah, definitely I'll give it a try. All right. You are very yeah. quick in answering yeah. your uh, rings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um... Yeah, like I was saying, so there are two main things, which is the Chaos Center and the Chaos Agent. So since the Chaos Center is the 
home for all the activities happening around chaos. It basically it's like an umbrella of schedules, uh, monitoring, um, GitOps, every and any possible uh, solutions that you would find in the uh, chaos execution, chaos workflow. Everything is controlled under Chaos Center, and then Chaos Agent is what actually helps you connect uh, this external cluster. So what I mean by that is, let's say you have two applications. So one application is on running on AWS, another is running on Azure, for example. So, um, and, and let's say your um, Litmus, let's say you're not using the SaaS version, let's say you're using the core Litmus version, that, that also requires a cluster, right? So you have installed this um, Litmus on a GKE cluster. So everything is in a different cloud provider. So how would you connect these two applications uh, that are running on two different providers? So that is where the chaos agent comes in. So you can have your chaos agent sitting on these two, uh, um, these two providers, and then the agent would be responsible for uh, like picking out the different applications running on that cluster. So in this case, let's say if your agent is installed on AWS, then if you install or run any kind of application on AWS, then it would uh, basically pick up that okay, you are running this is this application. So this this namespace is available to you. So do you want to run chaos on that namespace? And so like you you can filter it with labels and stuff like that. So that way you can target applications running on multiple cloud providers. And this is not just limited to AWS or GCP. Uh, there's a list of providers, uh, Rancher and all these things that you can also uh, use and target. So yeah, that's the main purpose of a chaos. It's nothing like but a subscriber that's sitting in your cluster where your application is there so that it can connect to your application. Okay. So that's the purpose so, of... Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, you mentioned Rancher as provider. So you have other uh, Kubernetes distribution as a provider like Tanzu, OpenShift, Platform 9, and things yes. like that? Yeah, we support OpenShift, we support Rancher and those things. So there's a list of uh, supported platforms can show you real quick. And now, I, it's not, I, I'm not going to do chaos engineering just for the application. I might be doing it for the infrastructure itself, correct? Like after an update okay. or something. I mm -hmm. can run uh, certain chaos experiments to make sure that my uh, uh, infrastructure components and infrastructure uh, or the application is uh, still intact, still reliable, still resilient. Yeah. Right. So definitely you can do that. So that's why you, we have IO level chaos. And there's also something called M agent that's uh, coming up or like there's a, it's, it's, it's in beta phase right now, which lets you target your hardware resources generally, like the lower level of your uh, infrastructure so that you can exploit your infrastructure more. So previously we had these experiments okay. in the hub, which. Interesting. And what yeah. if you, uh, how are you going to test your infrastructure? I create a clone of your infrastructure to a different environment and oh. uh, run the test there because it's very risky to run this kind of test on, uh, well, I heard already that they can be run on production, but isn't it risky? Really? Yeah, definitely. That is risky. So that's why uh, what is preferred is you have uh, a staging environment or a separate environment where you do all this kind of tests, especially for the infrastructure. And especially like you, you can do it in production, but definitely it's risky. So people generally prefer doing this kind of things in a separate environment. But yeah, uh, we do not really clone the infrastructure when we do the testing. Imagine directly like targets your infrastructure and exploits it. And let, let's say something goes wrong, it's sort of, there's a rollback mechanism automatically, we call it revert chaos. So it sort of reverts it back to the original state. But let's say you, uh, like it doesn't keep a copy. So let's say you target something which is uh, very critical and you cannot revive it back, then yeah, probably you have a broken system. So yeah, that, that's why it's in beta. We still need to do a lot of experiments on top of it. But um, like, if you generally want to target your uh, infra level components, that's why we had this uh, infra chaos tags, right? So in this case, a disk fill or a node CPU hog or a node drain. These are like stable uh, experiments that are there in our hub and these are tried and tested. So in cases like this, you can use node level experiments, 
you can hog, you can do a overload, uh, fill of the disk and those kind of things, IO stress. So these kind of infra uh, chaos we do offer, which are tried and tested, but the lower underlying level, which will actually exploit and destroy your infrastructure, that is the image in part, which is currently a beta thing. So, yeah. I like your labeling infra chaos. Yeah, love it. Yeah, so it's like gives the user an idea that what might break your system so that before they go and try everything, they know it's better that it might affect your system. Cool. So let me switch to the two different phases that I was talking about. So there's the chaos control plane and there's the execution plane. So the control plane is everything that I mentioned, the chaos agent, the your center, the authentication server, GraphQL, and everything. For the execution plane, what I mentioned in the previous slide, the chaos experiment, the chaos engine, the chaos result, those things are part of the chaos execution plane. So it's uh, that simple. So chaos control plane requests for data from the subscriber. And subscriber is also something I mentioned that we have two different clusters. Uh, subscriber is sitting there, which is the agent. So the agent is sitting there. You want to, let's say, target a Kafka pod running, Kafka uh, deployment running on that. Um, Azure container, Azure cluster. Then your subscriber is sitting on the Azure cluster. It's seeing that you have a Kafka uh, deployment running. It'll target it. It'll like sort of uh, match the namespace and the label and everything. And it'll run the entire like, like the entire flow that I just mentioned of fetching the chaos experiment, running the chaos like uh, tuning the chaos engine, calling the operator. Operator will see if everything is there and then trigger the chaos uh, chaos experiment. So at the top you see a chaos workflow CR, right? That is. Uh, nothing but an Argo controller. So we use Argo behind the hood. So basically, uh, the everything that you see, the nodes and everything are being spawned up by Argo. And Argo is actually the one helping us to map these kind of different data and uh, sort of visualize and also sequentially do this uh, workflow in a queue format. So yeah, we use Argo behind the hood, who actually takes this workflow CR data and uh, paints the UI. Cool. So let's take a look quickly at the features that it offers in a very quick uh, overview because we already talked about most of it. So we have the portal, which is the chaos center that I just said, enterprise chaos hubs, which is like both private and public chaos hub. So you can connect your private hubs if you have private experiments that you want to run and do not want to use the public ones. Uh, you have chaos scenarios, which is like a chaining of multiple chaos experiments together into a single scenario. Then you have also something called as chaos probe. So currently we support Four types, which is HTTP, KHS, uh, uh, PROM probes, and CMD probes. So these are the four uh, PROMQL probes, basically. So these are the four types of probes that we support. And probes are nothing but like um, extra uh, pluggable checks that you would want in your application. So let's say you want to do pod delete, but uh, you want to do more than pod delete. So you want to delete a pod and then actually want to use the HTTP probe to see if uh, let's say there was a service in the same, like there's a, I've exposed the service with the same pod, and you want to see when you're doing the pod delete if the service, let's say it's in a load balancer, if that endpoint is still accessible after you are deleting the pod. So that would mean there's something wrong, right? So if you have deleted the pod and then you can still access the endpoint, then something is affected. So those kind of checks you can uh, configure with the help of probes. So there are multiple probes. So in this case, you can use an HTTP probe to. Uh, hit the uh, SVC endpoint, but yeah, there's other probes as well. So you can like use a CMD probe to uh, write a bash script and do anything inside the shell to uh, make it more advanced and stuff like that. So yeah, these are advanced checks that you can also do to tether to your needs. So yeah, that's uh, another feature. Uh, for security, and you can visualize. we have. So you can visualize and these probes in Grafana or somewhere else. Um, so the probes is like the monitoring part of the chaos engineering. Right, not, not right. necessarily it's monitoring. It's, uh, it's not necessarily monitoring. It's mostly about um, sort of uh, doing the health checks and giving you the result if it's working or not. So you would actually be able to verify the entire uh, workflow in Grafana, but not a specific probes. You would get the result and everything uh, in different uh, annotations on Grafana, but not specific probes. So you would see that, OK, there's a there's a probe success percent that is appended. So you would see what 
what is the success percent of the probe you applied, but you would not get a visual effect of only the probe in the refiner. But you'd get okay. the whole thing as a total. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for security, automation, and scalability, we have uh, the option of uh, using the same integration in a CI/CD pipeline. Uh, like a wrapper. So currently, you can use uh, vendors like Spinnaker, Captain, GitLab, GitHub Action. So those you can run chaos on these vendors, definitely. Uh, and uh, it's the same way, essentially, because it's also used as a chaos experiment, chaos engine, and everything, right? So uh, like there was a question previously, like what would be the time uh, it would take to run these kind of things in the CI. So it depends on the chaos agent. So let's say by default, we give it as a 60 seconds or one minute uh, of the exper one minute of time it will take to run these, but to initialize and like get a, let's say a end cluster or any kind of a cluster on the, on the CI itself would take a minute. So generally if everything is in default, it will take about two to three, do this entire process and give you the result back. Uh, but this that is a tune, tunable. So in the chaos experiment, you can mention the that I do not want it to be 60 seconds. I can make it 200 seconds or something like that. So that in, in that case, it will run for longer. So this kind of things you can do in the CI pipeline that would ensure that you have a robust system and that everything is validated in the pipeline itself. Uh, and GitOps we already mentioned about. And for the endpoints, you also have a hard you also have hardened images and uh, TLS endpoints that you get as part of security so that everything is yeah, and basically the, the applications that you you said that like GitOps that uh, can be run or uh, that on them can be run chaos engineering it means that they already mm -hmm. have the probes integrated and you can like they're ready and you you just run yeah so GitOps is basically them. whatever you're doing on the uh center right so that source of truth the where you're saving it is being changed to a uh, git based scm nothing else so if your workflow has probes the entire data would be stored in git nothing else so yeah it's like a bi-directional flow so there's something there's a microservice called event tracker which tracks the flow in both the directions so you will basically be using git as a single source of truth in in this case and scrape out mongo basically for workflows so if workflow has probes, then the probe data along with the entire workflow will be saved in Git. And then let's say you change something in Git, it would auto trigger in the chaos center. So that's the uh, GitOps oh, okay. integration that we have done. I thought that the applications that you mentioned are already prepared to be tested with chaos engineering. But it's like, yeah, a source code. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so for the enterprise support, uh, the CSAD part is a part of the enterprise support. You have integration with APM systems. And of course, uh, Harness's SLA support is also part of that because if you're taking the enterprise support, uh, for the community one, you would get community support. But for the Harness one, you'd get Harness SLA support and also the air gap support that I talked about in the beginning, if you take on them. Cool. Uh, so this is just an overview of everything that you get on the community side and extra things that you get on the uh, harness uh, chaos engineering side. So there's like uh, extra authentication, better authentic authentication, and also advanced experiment that you're getting as a part of uh, HCE. All right, so this this one I already talked about, chaos center and chaos agent when I was discussing the architecture. So it's the same thing, I'll be skipping this one. Uh, and another thing, which is the CLI, which we use to actually connect the agent. So to connect the, these two agents that I talked about, right? If you have a, a AWS or if you have Azure and you have uh, two different agents, two different subscribers running on two different clusters on this providers. So you would need to connect them somehow. So this is the binary that is uh, useful, that is used to connect these two clusters, which is the chaos, which is chaos CTL. For the open source version, this is uh, the same, it's called as Litmus CTL. For the enterprise one, we call it chaos CTL. So it would have some more uh, functionalities down the line. Uh, but yeah, for now, it's also publicly available and you can, it would just take the kube config and it would do a set a set account, set configuration so that it basically sets your uh, unique account based on the access ID and access secret. And then you would be able to connect your uh, agent in the project and the endpoint that you're running your project on. Cool. Um, and this is also, yeah, I talked about it when I was discussing the 
experiment section that you have support for multi cloud. You can target uh, applications running on AWS, running on Azure, running on, uh, like, let's say, VMware or GCP. These kind of things you can definitely target. Uh, and, and for these kind of things, you do not need actually Chaos CTL uh, connected because some of them are already uh, simple things like uh, AWS instance skill. So you can just skill an instance, uh, EC2 instance in AWS without any agent sitting there. You just have to provide the IAM secrets to uh, like store it as a secret in the cluster that you're running. And it would just scrape the secret out and target the EC2 instance and just drop it with the ID. So there are a few experiments which uh, are specifically only for the cloud. So you do not need uh, a subscriber connectivity sitting there as well. So these are like uh, just specific cloud experiments that we offer. Cool. Finally, it's demo time. Let me go ahead and do a quick demo. So what we have here is I have my uh, Azure uh, cluster connected. And this is a single node cluster. Uh, this is, I guess, it is uh, 16 gigs of RAM, 16 GB RAM, um, and four vCPU. Yeah. So I'm using a, a strong VM uh, because I'm going to run something called as Sock Shop, which generally takes a little bit of RAM. So this is Shock Shop GitHub. Let me just give you a quick overview of how it looks like. We just go to the images. This is the architecture of Sock Shop. Let me open this in a new tab. Right. Uh, OK, this is a little small. OK, this would be a little blurry, but OK, this, uh, let me try to open a new image. Uh, so the architecture is pretty simple. Uh, uh, just one second. Uh, it never opens the correct link. Maybe from GitHub? Uh, they don't actually Maybe have this architecture GitHub. from GitHub, surprisingly. Doesn't? I don't know why. Oh. Yeah, they just don't have this one in GitHub for some reason. Uh, OK, OK. Let me try one more time. This, this one looks clearer. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So this is the architecture diagram of Sock Shop. Uh, so what it what Sock Shop generally is? It's basically it's a Sock selling application that is purely for demonstration purposes, for microservice demonstration purposes. So it has all these different so like services or pods, right? So it has order, it has payment, user, catalog, card, and then um, on the back end, it has a messaging queue with RabbitMQ, which generally pass pass on the shipping data to the queue master. So this these are all like uh, very different uh, things which individual services that we can use to uh, you know, target and showcase different things. But for now, we'll be targeting this catalog pod. Uh, so what it has is it has two things. It has a catalog pod and it has a catalog DB as well. So we'll be targeting the catalog pod itself. And this is how it looks like. So this is the Sock Shop application. I already have it deployed in, in my cluster. So this part that you see uh, scrolling down, uh, moving, this is the catalog. So we'll be deleting the pod that is actually showing the catalog. So this is how it looks like. Uh, so this is the one that we'll be targeting, catalog uh, pod directly, not the catalog DB. So bear in mind, there are two things. So this is not the one that we'll be targeting, the SQL one, MySQL one. We'll be targeting only the pod. So what should happen and is- it's a single replica, single pod. Yeah, it's a single pod. Uh, so currently, there are two modes of deployments. So there's a resilient sock shop app, uh, manifest and there's a weak sock shop sock shop manifest so those things are also uh they're on test tools this is another repository of litmus inside test tools there is a weak sock shop yaml so this is the yaml that i applied uh, so in the app manifest you would find multiple manifests that you can use for testing as well there's a weak sock shop, there's a resilient sock shop. So in the resilient one, you have three replica sets. In the weak one, you just have one. So the weak one is meant to fail. The resilient one is meant to pass. So that, that's based on what you want to do. So in this case, I've deployed a weak mm -hmm. one, so it's just one replica set. Yeah. So we have uh, multiple other uh, options as well. So like in this case, the bank of Anthos is the one that's uh, useful for if you want to do black hole experiments and those kind of things. If you want to do a complete uh, packet loss, 
So the, you can definitely play around with the different manifestor as well. But for this one, this demo, I'm using the weak soft shop. So this is I'm going to pick a set. Cool. So uh, once we take this down, uh, our hypothesis is this should go go away. So this this part of the microservice should go down. The DB should still be up, but uh, the service would generally go down and all the other services since they're independent would still be up and you would be able to see all the other services but only this part would be uh, you know completely broken so moving on to our uh, portal so this is cloud.chaosnative.com this is where uh, you can sign up for the SaaS version so what you have to do is generally go to this link and just sign up either to github google or a local sign in and then you should be able to uh, go to this section go to the onboarding section where you should have a access key and access ID and then you can follow this step so you should see this generally on the first step it's first page itself since I have two agents I, I have to do it from this uh, UI but you should see the screen in the second step so you can download the chaos CTL the binary that I just mentioned so these are the two steps you need to download uh, so you can download it from here then you have to extract it give it some permissions and then you can set the uh, set configuration so you have to set the account and this is where you would need the access ID and the access key. And once you do that, you can uh, create the agent with the agent name and the project ID and the, uh, in a non-interactive mode. So that would basically connect your agent to this one. So that's what I have done. So I just had this Azure cluster. So I just connected this Azure cluster to uh, the SaaS version. So I just did a chaos CTL create cluster with a cluster name. I called it chaos second agent. And then I just gave the project ID. So yeah. That was that's how you connect uh, the agent to the portal. Once you're done with the connection, we'll just go to the Litmus workflows, schedule a workflow. And since I just have one agent, it's already pre-highlighted, pre-selected for me. I'll just go ahead and do next. And for this one, since we are doing a, a catalog, a normal catalog delete, pod delete. Uh, so I'll just select the predefined one and I'll just do some modification to it. So this is the predefined section where you get all the different uh, Manifest all the different predefined workflows pre configured for you. So you have Bank of Anthos, Potato Head, and Sock Shop. I'll just select Sock Shop for now. So this would be preloaded with uh, a lot of other information which we would not need. So I'll just trim this down a bit. So currently, you see uh, there are a lot of applications, uh, like a lo lot of experiments. So I would not need uh, CPU hog, memory hog, network loss, and also catalog disk fill. So I'll just need this one catalog or delete uh, and I'll just go ahead and do edit YAML so this is the entire YAML that I was talking about so you have your chaos experiment you have your chaos engine uh, at the bottom as well so at the top you have your blueprint you're calling the entire chaos uh, experiment so this is where you're installing the application so this part we do not actually need because this is a, a like a we already have it installed so we do not need that so in this uh, installed chaos experiments, you see there's a kubectl apply. So we are calling this from the hub, hub.litmuschaos.io. This is where you are actually pulling the experiment from the hub. So this is the chaos experiment YAML. And then at the bottom, we have this metadata in the data section. So kind is a chaos engine. This is where we're defining the chaos engine. You can do your tunings in here. And these are the probes that are, are part of the YAML. So these things, you cannot, like if you're an advanced user, you can do it directly from the YAML. But there's also a configurations wizard that's uh, then the UI, which you can use to modify these things uh, and that will auto automatically change it in the YAML uh, in the manifest too. So in this case, these are the steps that we need to take uh, in order to do this. So we would not need install applications since we already have Sockshop running. Uh, we would not need to do a load test. So let me delete that one as well. And since we do not have a load test, we do not need to delete the load test. So I'll just remove that as well. And and the type name for this one, I'll just call it week because we, are, we have applied the week sock shop uh, manifest. And we should be good. Let me save the changes and we should see a very uh, streamlined uh, graph, Argo graph, which would just be installed the chaos experiment, which is the catalog pod delete, do the pod delete and revert the chaos. So if we check the namespace, we are, th this is correct. So. We are checking for the sock shop namespace and our application is also running on the sock shop namespace as you can see at the top so we'll be targeting this namespace and also we'll be targeting this label name equal to catalog so just let me go ahead and do next next and schedule now and finish so once i do that my experiment should start running and 
we should see a graph like this come up. Now let me open this side by side so you can see what exactly is happening. In this case, I'll just uh, zoom it out a bit. So the so first uh, the container, it would kill the so pod, the yeah, the catalog pod, right? Yeah. So currently, um, and there once are, or uh, so you said the uh, you said in the beginning the case uh, engine by default is it one minute one twenty seconds? It's sixty seconds. Yeah. Uh, 60 seconds, okay. Yeah. So the so, bot recreated. Uh, the, yeah, oh, it's okay. currently installing the experiment. So you would see a helper pod generally spin up, and the helper pod would be the one responsible for creating the, you know, triggering the pod delete. So you will see this right now, uh, right? Like once the helper pod is uh, here, so it would take a bit of time. And then once it's done, uh, we should see this thing go down. So currently the timestamp is 84 minutes, right? So this thing uh, would go down and uh, we th this part should also just magically go away. So we have pod lead. Currently it's in the pending state. If we open the cluster. So you can see catalog pod delete is in a container creating phase. Now it's actually running. So it's just spun up 15 seconds ago. Now let me check the uh, like this is a watch mode of the sock shop. So let me just check what happens to this catalog pod. And we should see this one go down once the chaos starts triggering. Cool. So you can see the runner is up for two seconds. So this is the helper pod. So runner will spin up multiple chaos jobs. So yeah, you can see the chaos happening, right? So it got terminated and recreated pretty fast. So it's like catalog is seven seconds now. The timestamp is updated. And now let me try and refresh the shop application that's running. So now you see the catalog is gone, right? But the other things are working. So yes. the other part of the microservice are not affected. Only the part that we targeted is affected. So you can like, do multiple uh, combinations of this to test your specific hypothesis and steady state based on how your use case would fit this requirement. Right. So yeah, that was uh, that was the experiment that we wanted to show and how you can trigger it. So currently, I think the timing timer is too short, so it's like sixty second ish, and I, I think the interval is also very short, so it just triggered once. But yeah, you have to modify the, uh, what do you say? You have to modify the chaos engine to make it trigger more. So if I, if I did like 120 seconds and it would trigger twice and those kind of things. Cool. So that was the demo uh, for I actually see. bringing down. It's perfect for continuous integration. In that case, it's, it's not that time I like consuming. the demo. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Go ahead, Polina. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, thank you for the demo. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's like you can use it in multiple scenarios in your CI environment, in your CD, uh, like, yeah, there's multiple use cases that you can use this for. Cool. So uh, for future roadmap, we wanted to increase uh, more, uh, we wanted to add more support for non-Kubernetes infrastructure level components like we talked before, uh, and uh, for uh, like, application specific chaos. We already do have a few application specific chaos, uh, but yeah, we would want to add more of the application specific chaos, which has native faults and health checks. And uh, of course the chaos SDK we do have, but we, it can be improved and any, any of the, uh, you know, uh, software is an NT, like a continuous process. So we would love to in, uh, improve the chaos SDK for creation of more user defined experiments. And then uh, connect previous to four probes, which we would also want to increase uh, the type of probes that we support in the long run, so that we the users can dive with their state hypothesis validation and they can run uh, exactly what's on their mind and like explore with more possible scenario opportunities. And then also uh, improve observability for chaos experiments and definitely add more type of chaos, which are uh, like which 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 is all planned for HC 
by adding more and more advanced uh, uh, chess experiments so that people get don't get blocked by the limited uh, choices and like have more opportunities exploring these kind of experiments. Good. Great. I guess that was uh, it for us here. Yeah. If you yeah, have any thank you. Thank you very much, Sayan. Uh, it was very mm -hmm. informative, uh, theory-wise, and the demo went smooth. Uh, I like the demo. It's a very simple use case, but it shows the power of uh, uh, chaos engineering. Yeah. I mean, yes. And I, I see that in your clock, it's like 11.30, <laughs> nearly midnight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for yes. staying up late. Yeah. And, no problem. Yeah. We appreciate this. We appreciate this very much. Uh, Thanks a lot. Any questions? We'll use Lina it in our pipelines. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll check the in infra chaos. So. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Right. So there's no questions, and uh, I guess uh, we kept you up. <laughs> and yeah, so we'll see you again, hopefully soon. And uh, hopefully that we will start using uh, chaos, uh, litmus chaos, and harness uh, chaos engineering. Uh, and we start basically adding resiliency to our applications. The only thing that uh, uh, I have is that most likely that not every application will require resiliency. Now there is more focus on sustainability. So basically, mm -hmm. uh, you, you would like to stay away from resiliency when, whenever you don't need it. Like, you shouldn't be, what do you think? You shouldn't be like 100% resilient. There should okay, be like so, trade-offs between um, resiliency and sustainability. Right. So um, definitely for more important products or uh, whichever has a more yes. priority, I would definitely say a resilience check is a must. But yeah, for uh, other products, sustainability is definitely a plus. And also there's something okay. like, um, you know, uh, nightly builds and like those kind of things, right? So you can keep it there in the pipeline so that that way you always get a validation continuously. Uh, and then, you know, you're at least secure and like uh, happy that nothing, everything in my system is resilient. And I don't need to do it every day, but like uh, maybe monthly game days or something like that, that keeps like helps yes. keep your uh, resiliency in check. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Uh, thank you once more, Sayan. Uh, it was a pleasure having you both, Sayan and uh, uh, Brettiv. And uh, would love to see you again on this series. Thank you, Belina, for hosting us. And uh, wish you the best in your meetup. Thank you. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you for having me. Everything can okay. help. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.